so hello everyone uh it is a great delight to be on this call today um i hope that everyone again on the east coast stays safe in the midst of wildfire smoke coming down from canada this really is just another reminder that climate change is here and now and is an international issue that we must tackle collectively as most of you know, my name is Yush Stauchar, and I cover FCNL Sustainable Energy and Environment Portfolio. With me on this call is also Giselle Lopez Estrada, our program assistant for Young Adult Outreach. And Giselle is helping facilitate this session today. So thank you, Giselle. Uh, this is a special occasion for me, as this is actually my last call to conscience session in my fellowship. The next time you will interact with FCNL Sustainable Energy Environment Team will be when new climate policy lead and program assistant will uh, join the organization. Um, today we will speak about how we can decarbonize our homes using tax credits offered in the Inflation Reduction Act or IRA passed almost a year ago last summer. Uh, this largest climate law in the amount of 370 billion invests in lower energy costs for families, small businesses, accelerates investments in clean energy solutions, and strengthens supply chains for everything from critical minerals to efficient electric appliances. Earlier this spring, we had a speaker on the call uh, who talked about IRA benefits for houses of worship. Uh, we also wrote a blog post on this issue and we'll paste it uh, to the, and we'll play, and we'll paste the link to the post in the chat. Thank you, Giselle, for doing that. For today's call, I have invited a speaker who will talk about the tax credits you're able to use to decarbonize your households and decrease your energy bills. Barbara Briggs is on the call, uh, and she is the administrator for Friends Meeting of Washington here in DC. So uh, she's a local, um, and she also services as co-clerk for their Committee on Peace and Social Concerns. A lifelong social justice advocate, Barbara worked for over two decades with the Institute for Global Labor and Human Rights, leading on-the-ground research, media exposes and public campaigns to end sweatshop abuses, child labor, and human trafficking in the global economy. In 2016, she answered a deeply felt leading to work on climate change. She was deeply involved in the campaign that won groundbreaking clean energy DC legislation in Washington, DC. In 2020, she initiated a citizen science investigation into methane gas leaks, which found nearly 400 methane leaks across all eight of DC's wards and engaged more than 100 residents and people of faith. She now convenes the Beyond Gas Climate Faith Initiative to speed the district's transition from gas to renewable energy. I will now pass it to Barbara so she can begin with her talk. After pre the presentation, we will have some time for questions Please feel free to write them in the chat throughout the talk. Um, I will then read them out loud for Barbara. And those of you who will want to unmute yourself will have the chance uh, to raise your electronic Zoom hands and I will uh, call on you. Uh, with that, um, I will pass it to Barbara. Um, thank you so much for being on this call with us. Great, thanks, Yus and Giselle. This is this is a real honor. Um, our Quaker meeting, Friends Meeting of Washington, has been engaged with uh, FCNL for many many years and is proud of it. And this is just it's a really this is a really nice opportunity. Uh, another piece of work that we are engaged in here in Washington as Friends Meeting of Washington. Uh, has been on the climate issue and specifically on working to speed DC's transition off fossil fuels. And we know that we need to do that 
uh, in order to avoid catastrophic ecosystem collapse and you know and the and the climate disruption that we're seeing you know we're seeing more and more of now um and so we've been working on this climate issue for the past um three or four years and specifically looking at the issue of burning gas because 75 percent of our emissions here in dc the, you know, there are global warming emissions come from our buildings. You know, here we don't have industry. We, you know, we've got some cars, but somewhat less. So it's it's a big piece. And when we won the Clean Energy DC bill a few years ago, it put us on a pathway to electricity from 100% renewable energy. Uh, but it didn't provide such a pathway for stopping burning fossil fuels in our buildings. And gas is the big deal. Uh, and we know we can't meet our climate goals without doing that. But in the last couple of years, and, and I am going to get to the IRA in just a minute. Um, in the last couple of years, we have started to learn about the health impact of burning gas. And, you know, for instance, a child who lives in a home with even one gas burning appliance has a 42% greater likelihood of asthma. There are recent studies that um, babies and even in utero exposure to nitrogen dioxide can affect children's cognitive development. Uh, Burning gas makes many pollut pollutants, uh, fine particulate matter, uh, carbon dioxide, of course, carbon monoxide, nitrogen dioxide, and even bits of benzene and formaldehyde. Um, and so we know, and, and when you're, you know, using a gas appliance in your home, and especially, honestly, a gas stove, because it's right in the living area and typically not vented to the outside, uh, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's actually, it's much more dangerous and there are major health impacts for our families. Um, we wanted to see the impact on DC residents and we started a citizen science uh, investigation that we're in the middle of now. We're using these detectors to measure nitrogen dioxide levels in homes. And we're doing this in, in a, we're, we, we have a, a sort of a, a, a very strong partnership now with the Washington Interfaith Network, which is congregations across DC uh, Interfaith Power and Light, which is another faith-based, uh, uh, you know, congregational organization, uh, and the Sierra Club. So we have started measuring kitchens, and honestly, I've been shocked at what we've been found. What we found. I mean, we don't have all our numbers in yet. We're going to do a lot this summer, but the EPA says that the maximum safe level for exposure for essentially a healthy person is 100 parts per billion of nitrogen dioxide for a one hour exposure. And I would say that over half of the homes we're testing get to that level of over 100 parts per billion of nitrogen dioxide within 15 or 20 minutes. At, in some homes, um, we're, they're, we're seeing levels of 200 300 parts per billion, double or triple what the EPA is safe for an outdoor, you know, temporary exposure, you know, for one hour exposure. Um, we're seeing this especially, you know, maybe especially, you know, more of a concentration in homes with very small income. And so it tracks uh, somewhat strongly with you know, low income homes and apartments. And so there's there's a justice issue here that the people who in our town have higher proportions of asthma, COPD, hypertension, the things that are caused by emissions exposure um, are also getting higher levels of it in, in their own homes. Um, but I'll also tell you that we're seeing this in some, you know, pretty airy, 
nice, large, um, you know, larger kitchens with uh, fairly new uh, gas ranges and especially the ones that have like double coil burners. So they're actually, you know, these, some of these expensive ranges are throwing off a lot more gas and consequently higher levels of concentration. Remember, this is not a leak. Uh, it is an emission that comes when the stove is working absolutely properly. Uh, and of course, the heating appliances, you know, for water heating and furnaces are burning even more gas and then venting it to the outside where it's making a significant uh, contribution to our outdoor air pollution. So we now have really good reasons to want to move off combustion and Essentially, the watchword is, as you know, in our circles, is we need to electrify. We need to move to electric appliances. Here in DC, we're on a pathway for those appliances to be, um, to you know, to 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 be from a hundred percent clean energy sources by 2032. It's not. We're not all the way there. We still have some coal in the mix, um, but we are on the way. And as I said, there is. You know, there is no pathway and there can't be a pathway to zero emissions while we're still while we're still burning fossil fuels. Um, so how to electrify our homes? I mean, the, 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 the beauty of this is just as we're learning all of these things and just as, you know, it's, you know, now our pastime to really move on the climate issue. Um, the IRA has passed, and there now will be really significant benefits for moving toward electrification. Um, and, you know, what I can say about that is, you know, going to be in about two minutes. Uh, there's, I think, the best resource for you uh, is uh, Rewiring America has put out a guide to the Inflation Reduction Act, um, which basically gives information about what benefits are available. And I'm going to put the link in the chat in just, just a second. Um, but those incentives fall in, in essentially a, a couple of different buckets. One is upfront discounts or rebates for energy efficient electric home appliances. So we're talking induction stoves. Low income people can get up to $150 straight cash. Moderate income people about half that. Um, um, heat, uh, heat pumps also. Uh, there's attention to renters and making sure that appliances that can move with the renter also get benefits. So, for instance, I rent, and if I, you know, if I wanted to, um, I could get a, a pretty nice uh, rebate for a window unit heat pump to heat my home, or an induction stove, or an induction cook plate, you know, cooktop. Uh, all of these things reduce uh, both the indoor air pollution and the greenhouse gas and our reliance on fossil fuels for heating and cooking. So it's massive benefit. Um, the other bucket, so there's the rebates or the discounts, and then also fairly, you know, very significant tax credits. I looked essentially myself up and I pretended that I owned a house just because, you know, I figured homeowner. And I would count um, here in DC, my household would be a moderate income household, you know, just as an example, $100,000 a year. Um, and the upfront discounts total for appliances would be $14,000. Uh, available tax credits to a household earning $100,000 here in DC that's a homeowner is $8,250. And uh, when I um, 
switch out my appliances and move particularly to heat pumps and to heat pump wa uh, heat pump water heater, uh, the estimated energy savings is $1,500 a year. So quite significant. Um, there's a myth that uh, gas is more economical than electric energy. And uh, I think it's quite possible that our uh, fossil fuel gas utility country companies have had something to do with uh, fomenting that myth and making us think that gas is more expensive. Actually, uh, here in DC, uh, if, you know, if our buildings could, if, if houses could magically switch from, from uh, gas to electric, uh, it would be they would be paying about twenty five percent less in utilities. In other words, the the factors involved are um, are the price of the energy, the you know the price of the units of heat, uh, and if you look at the price of the gas units of heat, sort of averaged over twelve or thirteen months, because it it goes up and down and the price of the same units of heat for electricity, we actually have a really significant savings. Um, that's not 100% true. It's not true in all, you know, in, in all jurisdictions. I know in Massachusetts, for instance, electricity is priced a lot higher and people with who've moved to heat pumps are seeing just about you know, the same utility costs as they had before. However, they're throwing a lot less pollution into the environment. And when if they get an induction stove, they're putting a lot less, no pollution into their indoor environment. So I'm going to throw this link into the chat right now. Um, and then just, there's just really the, other thing that I think it's critical to think about here is, you know, I know that that we are sort of our, our point of entry and thinking about these issues is, you know, what's good for our families, what is healthy, you know, what is going to keep the planet in good shape or in, you know, or sustainable for our grandchildren. Um, what's economical and what's possible. Uh, but I, I suspect that you all wouldn't be here uh, except, you know, you know, for just that, you know, in the FCNL space. And that, you know, you are here and we are here together because social and economic justice is something that matters to us. And I think that this is a moment when thinking about the IRA benefits and how to make sure that they are well known about and that they are used and that low income and moderate income families have access to these benefits, you know, full access is absolutely critical. Right now, what we're seeing is that higher income families are more able to take care of themselves. Um, people who have the means are moving off gas, they're getting induction stoves because they are cleaner for indoor air, they are safer for their kids, they don't heat up the kitchen, um, you know, they're better. Uh, heat pumps, same, same thing, actually more economical as well as being better for the climate. Climate. Uh, combine that with solar, you know, with solar panels and batteries, and families in, you know, professional families in our area of DC and suburban Maryland are going down to zero utility costs and in some cases making more energy than they use because their houses are beautifully insulated and they're electric and they are and they are healthier. Uh, our neighbors in you know what we call east of the Anacostia, the lower income wards of DC, uh, don't have the ability to do this themselves. 
uh, they are, if they are homeowners, very often their homes are in poor condition. They are stuck on fossil fuel burning furnaces. Um, about half of homes in DC have gas, the other half are electric, uh, one way or another, often not very efficient electric. Um, and they do not have the means to make this transition by themselves. So one of the things that we've been focusing on a lot, especially with our partners in, in the faith community uh, through Washington Interfaith Network and their connections with congregations across DC is helping put out the word about um, the availability of these benefits uh, and also uh, pressing locally to see that these benefits are augmented with local money so that low-income people um, who together with all of us are facing this once in three generations transition to a different energy source and one that will be better for us on so many fronts, you know, that low-income people have the means to make that transition. Uh, and so that is something that we are working on. Uh, the IRA is a critical piece of the puzzle Right now, uh, as you're probably aware, the federal rules are supposed to come out for exactly how these programs are going to administer, be administered and what the guidelines are. They're supposed to come out any minute now. Uh, and then the state programs will be able to be put into place. Um, the, the Rewiring America uh, guide and also the calculator that's associated with the guide will be a critical tool for figuring out, you know, how, how we can all uh, move toward highly efficient electric systems. And it will also be helpful for figuring out how uh, neighbors who are lower income, who are maybe renters, um, you know, what benefits are available to them. And so, that so it's, it's important that we as as faith organizations um local nonprofits be very cognizant of that be spreading the word and be pressing our local governments to make full use of uh these benefits as well um that's all i got for the moment uh and maybe we can uh move to questions Absolutely. Thank you so much uh, for this presentation, Barbara. Maybe I, I would love to um, ask right away, um, you know, um, do you have any advice for how people can spread information about these useful credits in their communities outside of the DMV area? It seems like here in D.C., um, you know, I arrived in D.C. Um, just a little less than a year ago, right after the bill was passed in August. And it seems like we've been talking about a bill and celebrating it uh, since the passage. Um, but what do you think will be good ways for the government and organizations like FCNL to reach small towns, let's say in the Midwest, uh, to make sure that they also receive um, these benefits? I honestly have found the best tool to be that Rewiring America calculator. Um, it's, it's very cool. You plug in like where, where your zip code, your income level, if you're a homeowner or if you're a renter, you press a button and it tells you what benefits are available and under what programs. In other words, how much for a heat pump, you know, what, what are the, like the rebate cash money and then what's possible in terms of tax breaks. I think that is, you know, I mean, that's a super good tool. And there's a ton of background information available about various different programs. I also think, and this is a, a little bit not a direct answer to your question, but my impression where we live is that doing the education about um, the health implications of gas and 
also, I mean, there are, and, and, and also like how, um, how helpful electrification can be both economically and health-wise, both in terms of outdoor air pollution and in terms of indoor air pollution. I mean, the fact that a, a kid who lives in a house with a gas appliance has a 42% greater incident, you know, likelihood of asthma. A recent study found that a full 13% of child all childhood asthma was trackable directly to gas stoves. And one of the researchers who did that study said that she could predict, she could, she knew a family's um, cooking patterns by their child's rhythm of asthma attacks. I mean, why would we, why would we do that? Um, you know, we obviously we didn't know, but but now we do, and we have really good alternatives. We're doing um, we're doing induction stove demos. You know how much faster they uh, an induction stove boils water or makes popcorn. It sears meat. You can make a soup. It's beautiful it, and it's safer. It's cool. And once people get, you know, get the idea that there's an option and you know the induction cooktops are like 70 you know they're 70 bucks they're not very expensive uh and so i think that there will be room to start introducing how good these new technologies are um you know that's helpful data thanks for that um Diane's wondering what company makes the NO2 monitors, just like the one you showed earlier, and how much oh. do they cost, how accessible they are? <laughs> this one, this is the best one that we've found. The brand name is Aeroqual. It's an Australian company. And then the distributor in, in uh, the United States is Specto. Um, they're real easy to use. You just press the button, you let it sit for a while, it equilibriates. Um, the cost is, total cost is about $1,200. And that's for the, this part of the device is uh, 550. And then this is a sensor for nitrogen dioxide. This device can take other gas sensors as well. And the sensor bit is actually 650. So that's that's a little, even a little more pricey. The induction cooktops um, just take a regular three prong plug. I'm just seeing some questions in the chat. Um, the induction stoves do take a, a 230 line. So typically one would need to get an electrician in and also just cutting off the gas, capping it, and that sometimes involves an inspection. So it is a bit onerous. Uh, and the IRA has uh, cash rebates available for electric upgrades and for panel upgrades. So there is, you know, there, there's money as well as tax breaks available for that as well. I see a question from Susan. Um, who asks, how do we minimize or justify environmental damage from replacing or pitching usable appliances? I think this is an excellent question. Um, given how much environmental damage those appliances are creating just by doing what they're supposed to do, you know, burning gas, um, you know, I think, A, that's, an important piece of the calculus and B, metal can be recycled. And I know it often isn't, but it, it can be and it should be. So we know we're gonna have to do this transition in order to protect the planet. And to my mind, you know, I mean, economically, many people are not going to switch out their furnace until end of life or close to end of life. Uh, but that what that means is that those of us who are aware and concerned about the issue need to be pushing this now because every single furnace that goes that goes in that's you know a gas for gas switch means another twenty years that that homeowner isn't going to want to get off gas. Here in D.C., 
our gas company wants somewhere between four and five billion dollars to do wall-to-wall -wall pipe replacement. That's their solution to the problem that pipes are leaking. Unfortunately, methane, as you know, leaks where it is drilled, where the fracking takes place. Um, I mean, you can see the drilling fields of the Marcellus Shale and the Balkan Shale and the Permian Basin from, you know, with infrared uh, photos from a satellite. It leaks in the pipelines and it's leaking under our streets. Um, and until we start actually decommissioning pipelines and cutting our dependence, we A, are going to have the expense of that infrastructure, and B, there's going to be no, you know, there's really no stopping the leaks. And C, in our own homes, we're going to be burning the stuff and affecting our health because, you know, when you burn methane, it makes all these pollutants. Um, so Connie asked, um, if the credits that you were mentioning are mostly just federal or if you're aware of any, maybe if you're aware of any other like state-based credits outside of DMV area or like any states that are doing a really good job besides the sort of IRA work that we've seen. Right. Um, I know that there, that, that through the IRA, um, there will be all different state programs and states will have some latitude in terms of how they administer that money and how they actually apply apply programs. Um, and I understand there, you know, some of that is money for nonprofits to, you know, be the one stop shop or to help, you know, to help home homeowners or to help people, you know, learn and apply uh, these the benefits and move toward electrification. Um, I'm pretty laser focused on DC and also a lot of these programs have not come online because the federal rules aren't quite out yet. Mm. Uh, I will tell you that here in DC, we're pressing for, uh, a, a bill which has been introduced and there, we hope will be a vote in the fall. There's expected to be a vote in the fall. Uh, it's called the healthy homes act. And what it will do is uh, provide, it will leverage the IRA money, but add local money to uh, retrofit, in other words, transition 30,000 low and moderate income DC homes to from, you know, from gas, from fossil fuels to electrification for free. And we know that you know, there, there are tens of thousands of families in our low income community that can't sustain, hmm. you know, a, a switch in their equipment. They can't, they cannot pay for it. And this is a big deal. And so this bill will be a start in helping those low income people do the transition that we all need to do. So Susan asks a question that uh, I think is somewhat related to what you just explain is there a way for folks to find data on the number of gas and electric users um and renters and versus home owners in their communities like is there a way for people to access that kind of information um there you know we there there, there is and i am not an expert in that area. I mean, we have that information. Um, some of it is here in DC, for instance, some of it should be available through uh, your public utilities commission. Mm -hmm. um, and that there's also the, oh, I can get back to you on that. Um, okay. Sounds there good. is a there is a, a federal um, electrification bureau of electrification. That's not it. I'll 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 get back to you on that. There is a way to look it up. Sounds good, Anna. I want to give you a chance to to ask your question. Please go ahead and um, unmute yourself. Um, 
<clears throat> I <clears throat> I live in a big complex and everything we have in our complex is uh electric. Uh <clears throat> I don't know about the, the hot water that comes everywhere, but um our board wants to put in, and it's even hard for me to say this, they want to put in gas barbecue grills outside. <laughs> and I've come, you know, I've written a plea and sent it to them. I plead, pled with them, you know, at the board meeting over Zoom in person. And um, I want to do one more last attempt. I want it to be really bam, 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 you know? Uh, the the smoke we were breathing in 2020 in California, living downtown San Jose, the smoke, you know, from Canada, we're living with it now. You know, I've heard that it's, uh, uh, you know, and then that it's not just, they've said, oh, it's only a little bit because they're only gonna use, you know, it's only just a little bit. Uh, but I, I, what I'm looking for are links about the emissions uh, all the way along the line, the fact that methane, uh, you know, a link, authoritative link, that methane is 25% um, more potent than, uh, you know, like gasoline or greenhouse gases. Um, the fact that we have just this window of time before tipping points, a link to um, something as maybe a summary of uh, of the COP or the latest, uh, warning from um, the, the United Nations and then the report. Um, you know, all those pertinent links, I, I don't want to get into all the facts. I want them to be able to go and look at the links. And I'm wondering if there's a place where all of these these links or these uh, sources are, are put together. I mean, I don't really want to take an hour and a half just to sort out and find all the sources. Is there a place where these are available? Um, one good resource is our website, beyondgasdc.org. There are a number of good resources there. Um, a, a sort of a, a, a quick reference, if you look at the Rocky Mountain, in, if you Google Rocky Mountain Institute um, gas stove study, uh, there's a fair amount of good information there as well. Um, I'm wondering if you and Giselle might have other resources at you know at hand that you work with. What was the, the first one beyond? Because I didn't write it down. And it was, uh, it's beyondgasdc.org. Just yeah, and then just... we can also follow up with all these uh, resources mentioned. And drop the chat. Was there another? Was there another one, Barbara? You mentioned. Um, the Rocky Mountain Institute did a study of uh, did a study of gas stoves, and there's there's some of the in some of the information and some of the things that I'm talking about um, are is are also included there. Um, and I see a question in the chat about sort of ga natural gas and propane. Mm -hmm. um, and just uh, natural gas is mostly methane, uh, but it has a little bit of propane as well. It's just a sort of a slightly different chemical composition. Um, I think that natural gas, mostly methane, and propane um, burn and make pretty similar amounts of nitrogen dioxide. Uh, but that's, and I tested my mother's kitchen, which is, um, she has a propane stove, um, and it was pretty high. Uh, but I, I actually don't know the answer to that question. But natural gas is 90% methane, and methane has 
86 times the global warming yes. of carbon dioxide. So um, propane is propane. It's a different element and doesn't have anywhere near the uh, global warming effect of methane. So true natural gas is the target. In fact, natural gas is a misnomer. It's really methane, nine tenths methane. So it gets an A minus in terms of 100% pure methane. <laughs> we should really be calling it methane. Yep, and we often do. Thank you. Barbara, um, are there are tax rebates and incentives in the IRA mutually exclusive? Like, what is no, the- No, they are additive. Okay. Um, the the incentives are sort of are, are on an income sliding scale. So you know if you're low income, you you get more, and moderate and higher income people get less. But the tax breaks are for everybody. Um, and then perhaps this is a different question because I know the tax credits for let's say nonprofits are. And you know, organizations are a little different than for um, residential communities. But what about Quaker meetings and um, let's say houses of worship in general that do not file tax reports? Would they get no rebate, or would they be compensated in another way? You know, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, I don't. I don't know. I mean, there may. I. Yeah. Yeah. I don't. I don't know. I mean, there may be uh, state programs, you know, with benefits for houses of faith. I think that's one of the category that's under consideration. Um, and I know that when we put solar panels on our roof at Friends Meeting of Washington, um, you know, it's it's dropped our utility bills by a lot. And we also were able to install uh, mini split heat pumps in, in most of our space. We still do have a, a gas HVAC system for, you know, for one, for one piece of our, our meeting house. Barbara, you mentioned you started working on climate issues more sort of intensely in 2016, or that's what we were able to read in your bio. Was there a turning point in that year that made you um, really sort of put more energy into this into this work? Well, um, I mean, I had worked for many years on the issue of international labor rights, like sweatshops and child labor. And during the last period, my, you know, my small um, research and sort of expose organization and campaign organization uh, had moved to Pittsburgh where the steel workers gave us office space. Uh, that was at the end of 2008, beginning of 2009, which was just as the drilling and fracking boom was getting going in Western Pennsylvania. I mean, all of a sudden there was this relatively new technology of hydro fracturing and the traditional oil wells that had been dug, I mean, it was the first oil drilling area in the United States was Western Pennsylvania. Those wells had gone dry, but with fracking, all of a sudden they were getting some oil and large amounts of gas, plus you know, the Marcellus shale, which was a deeper level of, of um, gas and oil, you know, gas shale. So I, at that point was still doing the labor rights work, still, you know, very busy. Uh, but I started seeing the devastation that was being created by fracking. And it was, you know, stuff like um, drill pads being put on farms and all of a sudden wells that had been used by family farmers for generations were methane and ethane and barium infiltrated and they couldn't be used. People's farm animals were getting sick. The fracking fluid is a, a mix of toxins and it was, and they use a lot of it and it was just being dumped. Um, 
well um, streams were getting silted and were being polluted, farm animals were dying, people were getting sick, uh, and the air was a mess. I mean, the Allegheny National Forest, that big green space in the middle of, you know, in the middle of Western Pennsylvania, you would think it would be this extraordinary wilderness, but it's got roads bulldozed at every hundred yards in certain parts of it where they're drilling for oil. And the water is a mess and the air smells like gas. And I was just horrified and I started reading more and more. Um, in 2016, what happened was um, Donald Trump got elected and our labor rights work, um, it, it became clear that we had had a good run, but our little organization was going to go on a back burner. And for me, it was an opportunity to work on climate things, which is what I'd been, you know, reading about and working on, you know, in the middle of the night and when I took a lunch break. Um, so that just that. How about now when you're working with DC government, what have been some of the main challenges there on a local level? Um, the main challenge for us, and, and I think I'm guessing that all of you will see that, you know, the same challenge where, where you live is that business as usual is easier. Uh, and our utility also, you know, wants to keep it that way. So Washington Gas, which is our, our one gas utility, is owned by Alta Gas, which is a, a Canadian transnational fossil fuel company. And when they when there was an emerger uh, the merger agreement between Washington Gas and Alta Gas, which the DC government was very involved with. They signed an agreement saying that they would come up with a business model that would be in alignment with DC's climate goals. Well, they've put out their climate business plan and it's, you know, beautiful, glossy report, lots of cherry trees and blue sky on the cover. And they're basically saying, well, we're going to put some biogas in with the fracked methane gas. And that is somehow magically going to make it uh, okay and net zero. And we're going to accept four to five billion dollars in ratepayer money. That's we figured that's what we could use to um, replace the pipes. And in other words, it's it's self-serving and it is keeping them in business. And they're what they want is to keep selling us gas. Um, and the challenge is that our uh, our public service commission, which is our public utilities commission, uh, is very used to dealing with traditional utilities and regulating rates and keeping the utilities in balance and in business. Uh, and this concern that we really need to transition off burning fossil fuels is something that 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 isn't something they can comfortably handle. And so we're still at a point that there's no commitment to actually make a plan and implement a plan to, to move DC off fossil fuels. And we know we need to do it, but our own public utility commission has been, you know, a, a, a blocking point. What are some of the um, ways of advocacy you've been using? Have you been lobbying the city councilors or have you been writing petitions or what does your work look like? Um, we have, uh, we meaning Washington Interfaith Network and the faith groups we work with and Sierra Club have participated in, um, actually, I mean, some of our members are, are talented at writing up ideas and have you know helped helped shape some of the legislation and track it and you know sort of shape it shape it some more as it's going through the process um we do a lot with i mean like like you do like fcnl does um helping 
regular residents and members of the community understand what the issues are and then speak up, you know, from their and their families and their communities point of view. And that is really powerful. I mean, a year ago, uh, we released a report about gas leaks, gas leaking from the pipes under the streets. And we decided to do it on the day of the Public Service Commission oversight hearing in DC Council. The, the, the prior time that that hearing, the year before when that hearing had taken place, one Sierra Club member, white guy, um, had testified. We sent in 80 people and it was very, very diverse. It was, you know, church ladies and people from the historic black churches here in DC. It was um, rabbis. It was a 14 year old boy scout from the local mosque. And you could just see how how the fact that it was kind of regular old, not your usual lobbyist, um, captured the attention of the council members. You know, they just reckon, oh, these are these are my people, these are my constituents, and so we do a a lot of that, a lot of working on a congregational on a congregation level. When we did the gas leaks testing, we started with groups of, you know, earth care or, you know, sort of en environmental committees in churches. And then we would look for the gas leaks right around their churches. You know, now we're doing educational events and also um, gas stove emissions testing, both in church basements and then having members go and organize their neighbors. And we're doing it in their kitchen. Sometimes it's just one, sometimes it's a whole cluster of neighbors and we go from one house to the next. And, and while, while we're doing it, it's not just gathering data, it's a conversation, which, you know, I know you all are, are really smart and really good at. So what's been most challenging in, in, in those conversations, like, are people understanding the benefits of working on these issues and gaining these benefits, tax, tax, tax credits that will help them decarbonize their spaces and make them more healthier? Do people see those benefits as well as you do? I think we're getting there. Um, we, 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 we had a big win in the local budget uh, that we just, we just went through a budget season and we got $2 million for a pilot project to electrify uh, a neighborhood, actually two neighborhoods here in DC. And in those neighborhoods, uh, the local churches have been working hard with Washington Interfaith Network on just door knocking and educating uh, their members. And there are people who are just are very excited. You know, they thought that gas was the best thing, that the gas stove was best. And now they've begin to, you know, they begin to understand the climate issue, but even more so the health issue, because uh, asthma is absolutely endemic in the neighborhood. And something that could contribute to it that actually can be put an end to is really exciting. Doing uh, doing the citizen science, the actual emissions testing has been quite helpful because it allows you to see something you never saw before. I mean, my own kitchen, if you use that benchmark of 100 parts per billion is the maximum safe level uh, for a one hour exposure, my own kitchen goes to 230 parts per billion in about 20 minutes. So it's over twice. And that can be you know, that's something that we've been doing all along is contributing to us being more sick, our kids being not as healthy and having a conversation about that's really on a couple different levels. Here's some, here, here are the things we can do immediately. 
oh, you have a toaster oven, you can use that. You have a microwave, you can use that. You can open the window, you can use an exhaust fan. Um, and in the meantime, here are the IRA benefits and there, you know, here are, um, here are rebates and tax breaks in the pipeline. So you can start to think about how you could switch out your equipment. And here's a law we're pushing to pass, the Healthy Homes Act. Um, and let's get together to do that. And that, you know, sort of multi-level conversation that has to happen over time. I mean, it's never just one conversation. Um, is, you know, it's 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 having an impact. It's going to take a lot of work. It's very hands-on. Um, but I think that FCNL and the work that you do is based very much in that same kind of sort of smart information sharing along with persistence and an understanding that maybe there has to be multiple conversations and a lot of listening. Thank you for that. I will ask the audience if there are any last questions. Uh, we're at 3.59. If there is no questions, um, I would like to thank uh, Barbara for her time um, and thank all of you uh, for attending this, this session called The Conscience um, today. Um, again, this is my last session. Uh, it's been more than wonderful interacting with all of you over the past year during my fellowship. Um, such a great opportunity to work um, with our grassroots um, activists starting back in August to meeting lots of you at our annual meeting uh, in November. And I just want to say how grateful I am uh, for the opportunity. Um, but thank you again um, for attending today's session. Thank you, Barbara, uh, for, for attending in Thank you, Giselle, uh, Thank for you helping so much. out.